Good evening. My name is uh, Usha Ramanujam, and uh, I chair the internationalization committee here at uh, Portland Community College. I'm also a full-time faculty teaching business here at uh, Rock Creek campus. I work with uh, both um, Shannon and um, Matthew in the same division. Um, welcome to all of you coming this evening, um, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, Portland Community College has the unique honor to have a Fulbright Scholar with us, um, very prestigious. And um, today's event is made possible through a Fulbright Scholar Lecture Fund, which enables um, the scholars to come and share with us about their uh, research experience and um, something about their home country and also have a dialogue and discussion with the audience. Um, today, I've already listened to her two times, and uh, you are in for a treat, I can tell you that. Um, through internationalization here at PCC, we try to promote um, global awareness, and also to improve um, cultural competency. So I'm really glad we have uh, an opportunity to do that today. And um, I, right now, I would like to invite Shannon Baird, who is um, um, Building Construction Technology instructor. He wears several hats. He's the department chair for the uh, Building Construction Technology. And he also um, chairs a committee called Career and Technical Educational Department Chairs. So he has many important role, and uh, um, I want to thank his students for being here, and also ESOL students of Matthew, and I see several faculty also here. Welcome. I don't want to take too much of any, any more of your time. Uh, here is um, Shannon Baird. Thank you, Risha. OK. Um, so I want to I want to welcome you all here, um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Liu in just a second. I, when Usha came to me with the idea of bringing a Fulbright Scholar to Rock Creek, um, uh, I was intrigued, and particularly um, when I saw the uh, the profile uh, that uh, Dr. Liu had, and um, uh, and the topics that she was going to potentially uh, speak to, uh, particularly because. Uh, the topic that we've got her here for this evening is so topical uh, for us here in Oregon. Um, she's going to be talking um, about her uh, studies in China, but as you know, the, the uh, urban growth boundary that we have here in Portland has um, contributed significantly to the way that our settlement patterns have developed here in the region and have contributed to how we experience our place. Um, Portland is rapidly becoming a very dense uh, urban center, um, and yet we are still able to maintain uh, the rural and um, wild areas around Portland so that you can actually get out of the city very quickly and appreciate other parts of the state that um, many states in the United States are not affording um, their citizens because of the growth patterns that they're experiencing um, due to a lack of, of some kind of mechanism like we have here. Um, also, I would just mention that if you are not familiar with uh, uh, historic um, Chinese development, and um, in, in, at least in my uh, very limited experience, um, I've been amazed at the, uh, the richness and the depth of of uh, the Chinese uh, built environment and the the uh, the uh, culture that they have um, maintained and that is still visible. I had the luxury of working in China when I was younger um, and experiencing uh, several of their cities. I uh, had the pleasure of going back there last spring to Beijing um, and visited the Planning Museum in uh, Beijing, which is a, a marvelous facility that has. Um, multiple models depicting the historical development of the city um, and really gives uh, a fresh perspective on the scale of the Chinese experience, um, both historically and 
today, um, something that we out here in the West uh, have a very hard time grasping conceptually without actually seeing that. Um, so, so thank you for coming, and I'm sure that uh, we will hear more about that this evening. Um, Dr. Liu Zhang is a graduate of Tsinghua University in Beijing, um, one of the top two universities in the country. She holds a Bachelor's of Architecture and a Master's of Architecture and Urban Planning uh, from that institution. She also studied at uh, l'Ecole Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture de Paris-Belleville uh, in 2000 and 2001 and earned a doctorate degree in urban planning um, from Tsinghua University in Beijing in 2003. Uh, Liu Zhang has taught at the School of Architecture um, from which she graduated since 1994. Between 2007 and 2012, she served as an assistant dean of that school and has been an associate dean there since 2013. In her professional career in urban planning, Dr. Liu works both as a professor, researcher, and a city planner with particular interests in town and rural planning, rural pl urban planning systems, and also French urban planning. As an associate professor, professor, she chairs the design studio of town master planning and seminars on comparison of architecture and urban culture between East and West. She is currently a visiting Fulbright scholar at the GSD at Harvard. As a researcher, she either presided or participated in many research projects, including those sponsored by the Chinese National uh, Natural Sciences Foundation, uh, including evolution of urban planning systems amid transition based on comparisons among China, Japan, and France. She has also worked and collaborated with international partners on projects such as urban development in the megacity region of Beijing, for which she collaborated with the Center for Human Settlements at the University of British Columbia and also towards a new paradigm for urban development in the Northern Asian region, where she collaborated with the GSD at Harvard. As a registered urban planner, she has also been involved in practical projects urban, uh, doing urban planning and design studies for many Chinese cities, including Beijing uh, and many others. In addition to her academic duties at her university, Dr. Liu was a visiting scholar for the Center for Human Settlements at the University of British Columbia in 1995 through 1996, uh, as well as um, La Observatory d'Architecture de la Chine Contemporaine, Cité d'Architecture et du Patrimoine, Ministre de la Culture et de, <laughs> de la Communication de la France and the School of Architecture and, uh, uh, at Xi'an University. Uh, Dr. Liu also has published several books, both independently and collaborating with others, uh, notably Suburban Development Based on Regional Integration, Inspirations of the Regional Practice of Paris and Beijing, and uh, Olympiad, a study of, on after games reutilization of Beijing's 2008 Olympic Games. Dr. Liu Zhan has frequently published in academic journals in China, as well as around the world. Um, the list is exhaustive, as must be Dr. Liu's life. <laughs> Please join me in providing Dr. Liu with a very warm Oregon welcome. Okay, thank you, uh, Sharon, for your so detailed introduction. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, being at uh, uh, PCC the whole day. Uh, I have to say I talk too much today in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, mostly in my previous two talks, I talk about uh, the city development in Beijing. It's like a more urban development. I think in the evening we will talk another side of the country, so we are going to talk about the rural development in, in China. So uh, the topic you might see from the urban rural deal system is a very special institute in China and which has a strong influence on the spatial development, uh, particularly in the rural area. So uh, I will start. Uh, Still, so I will start with a. Uh, 
a short story on urbanization in China. So everybody knows that uh, things uh, reform in the late 1970s. China has seen a very quick econo economic development, but also very quick urbanization. So you look at the figures in the past decades, uh, in average, its urbanization rate increased by 1% every year. 1% is a very small figure, but don't forget the huge population of China. You plus 1.3 billion, that means every year we have almost 40 million people migrating from the rural area to the urban area. So that trend continues in the past three decades. And uh, nowadays, uh, in 2015, uh, the urbanization rate in China is already over 50%, and we have uh, more than uh, 700, 770 million people living in cities. So this is a, a big number. So when such huge number of people go into the city, the city has to provide them with housing, with jobs, and also with public space, uh, services. So we have to build a lot to provide them. So these all astronomic figures tell you how much we build every year. So again, in the past the three decades, every year we complete 1.15 billion square meters. That means completion. We complete that. If you look at the number we put on uh, construction, it's almost uh, uh, triple. So every year you see a huge number of constructions everywhere, and every year we finish a huge number of floor areas to accommodate such huge number of immigration. So all this diagram, just to let you know, this is the construct uh, the. Uh, floor area completed in the, in the year 1985, uh, and it's doubled in the coming two years, uh, almost tripled again in another 10 years, and then you see it's, it's increased by times every year. So uh, all these constructions happened in cities, so during this period of time, we, see, we saw the increase of the number of the cities in China. For example, in 1980, uh, 1980, we had only 223 cities in China. And the figure increased to 656 in 2015. Uh, that not, uh, does not include small towns. At the same time, we also have more than 20,000 small towns, which also accommodate people migrating from the rural to the urban area. But anyway, all these constructions uh, for the immigrant people have to be located on the ground. And then that means every city increased in area. So again, we look at the figures. For example, in 1996, at that time, we already have more than 600 cities. The total built-up area for this six, uh, 666 cities are 20,000 square kilometers. And then you just see uh, 20 uh, years later, it's doubled, more than doubled. Now we have uh, 52,000 square kilometers for, again, 656 cities. Uh, we look at the figure for each city. That means in 1996, for each city, the built-up area was only three, uh, 30 square kilometers. And then 20 years later, it almost 80 square kilometers. So we can, generally speaking, it's, the cities grows in an explosive way. So this diagram shows the increase of the number of the cities. So things uh, uh, 19, uh, 1996, the number of the cities actually quite stable. But we look at the increase of the built up area. So this trend is still continue. So what does it mean in the spatial development? The urban, when you look at the urban expansion, that means we, we have seen a quick 
our very first urban development. That's a big achievement, uh, I mean, in human history, because we can uh, accommodate such huge number of people migrating from rural area to the urban area. But at the same time, actually, we are facing a lot of problems. For example, for many cities, especially the big cities, we are facing what we call it urban diseases. So it means in those cities, nowadays, your life becomes more and more expensive. You have to pay a high price for your housing, and you have to pay high price for good public services. And also, when the city becomes bigger and bigger, people live far, more and more far away from the city center where the jobs are located. So they have to commute every day. Um, I mean, uh, the traffic issue is uh, really a big headache, especially in Beijing, where I'm living. So normally, people uh, spend more than one hour for a single way, and then another one hour for a way back to their home. So it's not a pleasant way because it's not like the speed of, uh, let's say, 40 miles uh, one hour. It's only 20 kilometers per hour. So it's, it's really that you jammed on your way back. It's not so pleasant. And also in the social perspective, when the city becomes bigger and bigger, uh, in China, we also have a, like a social housing project, but most of this housing, social housing project uh, are located far away from the city center. So in a sense, we started to see the emergence of social in a, uh, segregation in housing. That means uh, people living in social housing, they are far away from the city center. Um, and also, uh, when we build up cities quickly, so we, we are actually uh, losing the sense of local identity. So most of the buildings are the same. You know, in China, we, we criticize a phenomenon. We say that one appearance for a thousand cities. That means every city looks the same uh, when you look at their buildings because they built up so quickly. We don't even have time to think about whether we can present our local identity through this uh, physical environment. So this is only one side of the society. At the other side, when, when we look at the rural area, actually when the whole China benefit uh, from the very quick urbanization, some of the rural areas suffered from this development. So we, we can call it uh, many regions suffered from the rural diseases. That means, uh, for example, a lot of villages disappear during the process of urbanization. So uh, people, when people move to the city, their building become empty. Uh, this is a very extreme example. This is a small fishing village in the coastal area of China. So all the villages moved to the city, and the whole village became empty. And then the nature eat up the whole buildings, you know, so nobody there. Um, even uh, worse, because most of the, uh, let's see, the, the, especially the male, male uh, population as a labor force, they move to the city to find a job where they can have a, a better payment. So only women, aging, and children left in the village. So that's actually destroy the social structure of the villages, destroy the community sense of the social village. And uh, uh, for a long time, when we concentrate, uh, let's see, when we put more uh, resources on the urban development, actually in the rural uh, area, there were not enough investment. So still in, the, in the many rural areas, they don't have quite good uh, public services. So their buildings are still in a quite uh, bad situation. Uh, their public services are still in backward, and both in quantity term and in quality term. So this, at the same time, all the problems we are facing in the, in the rural area. Um, there, there might be many reasons for the uh, 
declination of the rural area. And we can see that that's a quite natural phenomenon when the whole country is undergoing quick uh, urbanization. But I think in China, uh, there are another reason which contributed a lot to the declination of the rural area. So that's the urban-rural dual system. That system was set up step, step by step since the 1950s when China was in the planned economy period. Uh, but even though we have already undergone uh, reforms since the 1980s, their system still exists today and also still influences the society. So we will uh, start to explain what does it mean by a urban rural deal system. So before that, we will uh, make some clarification about the terms that we use. So um, normally we describing, uh, sorry, city or countryside or urban and rural, so we have all these terms to, to describe um, uh, the objective that we are talking about. Uh, generally speaking, both of them refer to two different kinds of uh, settlements where humans live, right? Uh, we can see they are quite different, for example, in terms of population size, city or urban area, they have a big population, they have high population density, and also they have high construction density. And also when you look at their economic structure, primary is almost something that you can just neglect for city or for urban area. But on the other side, when you look at the countryside of the rural area, they normally have a small population, low population density and the construction density and the where primary industry is still important for, for that area. So that's the difference. And the, in the physical sense, they are quite different from each other. So it's easy to see, okay, this is rural and this is urban, or this is countryside, this is actually the city. Uh, but in terms of a jurisdiction, normally city and countryside uh, refers to uh, administrative uh, entity. So normally we have very clear boundary for them. But for urban or rural, uh, it's just a, a phenomena. So uh, let's see, when ur uh, urban and rural is just they, they coexist with each other, but the boundary never fixed. When urbanization continues, the boundary can be shifted from urban and then gradually to the rural area. So that means the boundary can be changed along with the process of urbanization. And um, in China, we have a special uh, 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 definition of city and the countryside. So here I just listed uh, the, all the uh, uh, administrative uh, entities in China. So the whole country is divided in, into 30, uh, 34 provincial uh, entities. And then each provincial uh, entity will be divided into municipalities or autonomous prefectures. And then this level will be divided into the county level, like urban districts, suburban districts, or county level city, county, autonomous county. And then further, you have the towns. So it's a, a hierarchical system. It's like in the United States, the federal is divided into states and state divided into uh, counties and cities, it's like that. But here you have, even though you have this division, but you have the parallel relationship. But in China, it's typical vertical relationship. And among all these administrative entities, some of them are designated as city. So for example, at the provincial level, the municipality under the direct jurisdiction of the central government, they are regarded as a city. At the prefecture level, municipalities are regarded as city of prefecture level. At the county level, so we have the county level city. So they are regarded as city. And for towns, only the designated towns are regarded as the city. And all the others, they are regarded as countryside. So that means even from the jurisdiction pr perspective, all these entities are already divided into two kinds of jurisdiction. So normally the city, they have more power 
uh, while the countryside, they have comparatively uh, less power. And uh, um, then you may ask uh, how, how can we go up in, the, in, the, uh, in this hierarchical system? So uh, again, this is a big difference between China and the US. I, this time I know that in the United States, your cities are actually cooperated. Nobody can designate. But in China, either towns or cities, they are actually designated by the superior government. And then whenever you can meet, uh, meet the criteria, you can become either a town or county level city or a city. So by that way, you can go up step by step. So I, I will not go into details, but I will let you know how we uh, designate uh, a, a, a town, a city, a jurisdiction. For example, whenever you are in a place which is the county government seat, and then you have the, uh, uh, you can be a candidate to apply to be a town. And if you are a township, and then you have a, a population bigger than that, and also you have a percentage, certain percentage of people as urban population, and then you can be uh, designated as a town into a city jurisdiction. And then the same, to be a county level city, uh, all these localities, you have the, you can be the candidates to apply to be a county level city. And for that, we will look at your population density, size, and also the ratio, or ratio of population who are engaged in now agricultural activities. Uh, and also like the urban, the, the size of the urban population. We will also look at your economy, whether it's big enough, you have like industrial, uh, uh, industry is big enough, uh, how much you produce as a GBT, uh, uh, GDP, and also the economic level in per capita, uh, I mean, uh, terms. So we will look at the economic level of your locality. And also we will see whether you can provide uh, public services for your residents. So all this will be the criteria for you to, to judge whether, um, whether these entities can be designated as a, a county level city. So it's very complicated. Uh, I just listed there. So um, according to that, um, and then you can apply, and then you can be approved by the superior government, and then you can become a county level city. The same logic for city. Again, uh, only county level city and the designated towns can be a candidate to apply to be a city. Um, and uh, also we will look at the population economy and also we will look at your role in the region, whether you can be a, like a center for one region, if you can, and then you can be designated as a, a city at the municipal level. So again, you have all these criteria here. I will not go into details. So, but anyway, this is logic, how we can uh, make towns to be cities and the, from city of the city, uh, county level to the ministry level. At the same time, about the urban and rural, that's like the um, objective words to describe which is urban and which is rural. Um, here I take France as an example to show how they, they uh, decide. It's, it's quite easy because in France, they have the, uh, the, uh, the most local level, they have the commune, which is the local autonomous. So in France, uh, commune is very small, so they just take that one as the uh, uh, unit. So there are three criteria. So uh, you have to meet the three criteria at the same time, and then you can be recognized as urban. If you cannot meet, and then you are rural. So it's very clear. So when you have a population size bigger than 2,000 people, and uh, more than 50% of those people living in the central area, how they can define a central area? Very uh, simple. Uh, whenever two buildings, the distance between the two buildings is smaller than 200 meters, 
they can clarify this area is a central area. So if more than 50% people living in that area, so you can reach that one. And at the same time, uh, the, they will look at the primary uh, industry percentage in your economy. So you meet all these three uh, criteria, you will be urban. Uh, you miss one, you are rural. Very clear. But in China, it's, it's very uh, complicated. Um, how we define, actually, it's based on whether it's a residential community uh, jurisdiction area or it's a farmer's community jurisdiction area. So I just talk about the uh, administrative system in the hierarchical structure. But in China, you know, uh, in the rural area, we do have a kind of democratic system. We do have like a local autonom autonomy uh, in the rural area. So they are the farmers committee. And for the urban area, uh, we also have a kind of autonomous uh, uh, organization is the residential committee. So all those uh, committees, they have their jurisdiction area. So um, for any area in the residential committee, they will be regarded as urban. And for any in the farmers committee's jurisdiction area, they will be regarded as rural. Uh, but at the same time, they will also see whether you are in the actual built-up area composed of residents, public utilities, and other facilities. So the final, uh, I mean, definition, we look at that, still a very confusing. So for urban area, they refer to kinds of area. In cities or county-level cities, Urban area refers to the jurisdiction areas of residence committee and the neighboring farmers committee, both of them as part of an actual built up area in either an urban district or a city government seat. So very, actually, a lot of things in these words. So, and then for in counties and the towns, we refer it to township area that refers to the jurisdiction areas of residence committees and neighboring farmers committees. Again, as a part of actual built up area in either a county or a town government seat. Uh, beside that, all the others, they are rural areas. So we can simply think that rural areas, they only refer to the farmers committee's jurisdiction. But in urban area, that actually includes both uh, residential committee and also farmers committee. So it's like a, a mixture of these two. And this, we, we, can, we can now start to interpret the urban rural deal system based on the introduction. So urban rural means different jurisdiction with different powers and the rise. So already, they are already in different levels because we have the hierarchical system. Uh, the more upper, the more powers you can have. So already you see all the countryside, they are at the lower part of, of, of this system. And uh, also, um, then in a sense, in China, when you talk about city, normally city represents advancement. So cities, they, they are like an icon of modernity. And when you talk about countryside, it's like a represent of backwards. So that's already from the cultural perspective, already a big difference between the two um, um, areas. And what is more important is actually refers to the household registration and the land management. Household uh, registration is a special uh, uh, institution, firstly set up in the 1958, and then um, after 1990s, which under, underwent a series of reforms, even until today. Uh, what does it mean? In the, in the before 1980s, or let's see, at the very beginning, this system 
is try to uh, stabilize people on the place where you stay or where you were born. Uh, what does it mean? We divide the household registration into two types. One is non-agriculture, or you can call it urban household. Another one is rural household. Um, in the planning economy period, this refers directly to the social welfare which you can benefit. Urban household be means that you can benefit from the social welfare provided by the state. And the rural household means you can only support by yourself. You cannot benefit from the welfare uh, I mean, provided by the, by the state. And how we can decide whether you can have an urban or rural uh, household? It depends where you were born. If you were born in a rural area, normally you can only have a rural household. If you were lucky, you were born in an urban area, and then you can have an urban household. Also, that sometimes depends to your uh, family, family ties. If your family is an urban, and then you could have an urban household. Otherwise, you can only have a... a uh, rural household. Uh, at that time, this institution is trying to stabilize rural people in the countryside. Because at that time, China, I mean, PR China is a new uh, 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 regime. So they, have, they had a strong policy to uh, promote industrialization. But the country was not, uh, economically, economically was not big enough to support all the population, uh, or a big number of, of population in the urban area. So they tried to stabilize in the countryside. So normally, uh, when you stay there, you, can su you support your life by yourself while in the, in the city, because people will work for the industrialization, and the country will provide them with the social welfare. So that's, that's the uh, key idea. At the same time, also since the 1950s, we set up another uh, institution regarding the land uh, uh, administration. So what does it mean? It's again, uh, we uh, divide the land in the country into two sides. Um, one, one, one kind of land belongs to the state, and then another land, uh, another kind of land belongs to the local collectivity. So it does mean, it means, generally speaking, in urban area, lands belongs to the state. And also, mostly the land in the urban area can be used for construction. Uh, in the rural area, land belongs to the local collective economic organizations, like the Farmers Committee. And they can only mostly use it for agriculture and also for the village construction. They can only build for the villages rather than for the others. Um, before the 1980s, in China, we didn't have land market. So land use was free. You didn't need to pay. Only after the reforms, we set up uh, the new uh, regulations, and we set up the land market. And now this land can be transferred on the market. But at this time, uh, for the, urban, for the uh, land in the urban area, all the land can be transferred on the market. But for the land in the rural area, only the farmlands can be transferred, always for farmlands, for production. But for constructions, no, you cannot be transferred on the market. So again, uh, in terms of the land management, we actually separated urban from rural. It's really uh, two, uh, two, uh, two kinds of, uh, of war. Again, why in the 1950s we set up this uh, uh, institution as a, is the same for the household registration try to stabilize rural people in the countryside. Um, we try to avoid uh, uh, some problems like in the uh, Latin American cities. There are too many people moving into the cities, but the cities don't have the 
capacity to provide them with housing and jobs and other things. So for a long time in China, we tried to stabilize rural people in the countryside. But this actually also uh, uh, hindered uh, the development of the rural area for a long time. Uh, even though since the 1980s, after China uh, initiated the reforms and opening up, all these institutions has gone a series of reforms, but they are still existing and they still influence the society. Uh, so yes, as I just said, all these institutions were established in the 1950s under the circumstance of planned economy. Just imagine at that moment, we didn't have any market, no market uh, mentality. Um, so because also because at that time the country gave priority to industrialization. Uh, for that, cities are the base of in industrialization, so that's why priorities were given to cities rather than to the countryside. And also because of China's hierarchical administration system, everything can be done in the top-down way, uh, in a planned way. Uh, since 1980s, uh, already a number of uh, a series of reforms has been carried out. For example, for the uh, uh, criteria, all the designation criteria are already updated. And also, for example, for the household registration uh, in the 1990s, it was already encouraged the rural people to have their household registered in small towns rather than the big cities. For the big cities, it's a still big problem. But in recent years, it's also possible that uh, for any people, for example, I'm coming from a rural area. I go to Beijing to find a job, and I, I actually find a job. I, I want to stay. And nowadays, you can apply for a household registration based on your whether you have, uh, you have already a high education, whether you have already a job, if, whether you pay tax and whether you have a, like a permanent uh, residence in Beijing. So it's, all these things can be transformed into a credit. And based on the credit, you can apply a household in the big cities. So uh, already this is a big progress um, I mean, uh, in China. And also for land, uh, land management, nowadays we step by step to uh, uh, initiate the reforms. Uh, to let collective on land can be transferred on the land market. Uh, but generally speaking, in the, since the 1950s, uh, uh, the, the national policy favorite a lot urban development rather than uh, rural development. So uh, the influences of this urban rural deal system is far reaching and uh, can be seen uh, in many aspects. For example, um, as planner, when we work, we usually uh, work on the map. But it's very hard for us to know, to, to really know what are the boundaries for a, a residence community jurisdiction area or a farmer community jurisdiction area. So uh, it's hard to really know what are the boundaries for a urban area or, or rural area. And also, as I just mentioned, even uh, in the statistical perspective, an urban area can include both urban and rural. So that makes some uh, quite uh, confusion. For example, we talk about the urbanization level. So I just mentioned that uh, uh, in 2015, the urbanization level of China is already 50, uh, 56%. But actually in China, based on the statistics on household, the real urban and rural, the figure, for example, in 2012 was only 35%. If you uh, look at the uh, figure based on the statistical, it's, it was more than 52%. So a big difference. So nobody knows the real level of urbanization in China. Normally we see, okay, just to add them together and get the average. That's probably the real you know, uh, urbanization uh, level. And uh, uh, 
Here, I also uh, give you some um, numbers, look at the, the uh, urban and uh, I mean the city administration and the countryside uh, administration. So uh, nowadays in China, we still have a big number of uh, villages, but they are disappearing very quickly. So uh, that's one part. And then another part in the social uh, chair, in China, we have a large number of floating population. So I, I just uh, explained, I think I explained the floating population. Uh, you know, they are actually a big contributor to the city development, but they cannot benefit from the city. Uh, they exist in big number due to different reasons. For example, um, uh, we have some farmer workers, they are rural population. Uh, they want to be in, to have an urban household, but they cannot. But in recent years, there are also a new phenomena. There are some farmers going to the cities, find a job. They could have an urban household, but they don't want. Why? Because being a rural population, you can have your land in the countryside. Uh, you know, for urban population, we don't have the right to have the land because the land belongs to the state. But for rural population in the countryside, they always have the right to have a piece of land for their production and also a piece of land for their household. So today is already a privilege for them. They don't want to give up. So even though they have the capacity to be an urban resident, they don't want. Um, we have also a big number, I call them amphibious population. That means people always uh, transferring between countryside and the city. When they don't have any agricultural production, they go to the city, find a short-term job. When they have to do some uh, agricultural work, they just come to go to back to the uh, countryside. So they, they transfer between uh, the city and the countryside. The number is huge. So 247 million in 2016. So every year, you know, in China, we have a very important uh, festival. It's a little bit like Christmas um, in, 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 in the Western world. That's the spring festival. So during that period of time, it's a big challenge for the transportation. It's hard to buy a ticket, um, no matter by train or by bus. Uh, and also, more and more people nowadays, they prefer just drive uh, motor cars by themselves. And also, the existence of large-scale po uh, floating population is a big challenge to planners. When we do urban city planning, we always, uh, you know, struggling how to treat them. Uh, you, you, because you have to provide them with public services, uh, but they are not calculated officially in the population of the city. So there are always uh, uh, struggles with that. And uh, there, um, another uh, consequence is that uh, the rapid, I call them urbanization. Uh, that means the rural areas nearby the city, they are actually urbanized, but they still institutionally regarded as a, a rural area. So I give you two examples. This is my university campus. And so here, if you just look at the, this image, you might say, oh, this is an urbanized area. This is surely an urban area. But actually, this part is the university, so it's an urban area. But this part belongs to a village. So institutionally, they are still rural area. But actually, no people working in agriculture. They don't even have no piece of land for agriculture. They are just institutionally rural, but they are completely urbanized. Another uh, uh, example, again, you look at this one. This, this, uh, the CBD of Beijing is here, so it's not far away from the uh, CBD area. Again, this is uh, a small village. A village located in the green belt of Beijing, which should be replaced. But uh, they, they, are, they are quite clever. So they don't move, they just develop. So they, they have a quite good uh, industry with uh, furniture 
uh, firstly furniture production, and then later on they even shifted to furniture trading and furniture design. So again, when you look at, actually they don't have no land for agriculture, every piece of land is already built up, but they are institutionally a rural area, a village. Um, so, um, and, uh, but you know, in terms of land um, uh, administration, uh, in this case, they built up a, a lot of uh, uh, properties, rent to other, I mean, rent on the market. They even built like housing, which they can rent on the market. But according to the law of China, all these constructions are actually illegal. So they are not legally protected. Uh, they are cheap, they are very welcome in the market because they, uh, in this, in the, I mean, in the, in the rural area, you don't pay for the land, you just pay for the building. So it's much cheaper than the housing in an urban area because in the urban area, you use the land you need to pay, which is very expensive. So all these houses are very welcome in, on the market, but they are not legally protected. So again, this is a big problem. And also, uh, the, uh, the du uh, urban rural deal system influences the uh, planning administration. Uh, planning is also something quite new in China. Only in 1990, China issued the first city planning law, which enforced uh, the uh, urban planning administration in the urban area. But this urban area uh, mostly concerns the state-owned land. If the land owned by the local collective actually they refuse to follow the planning administration. So uh, in to, only in 2008, we updated the city planning law into the urban rural planning law, which tried to expand, expand the urban planning administration from urban area to rural areas. So only since 2008, it's possible that all constructions in, in the rural areas were regulated by that law. Before that, no regulation. So they just do whatever they wanted to do. You know, so that's uh, also a challenge. And because of the, uh, uh, the backward of planning uh, management, uh, I mean, uh, you can see rural constructions, particularly at the urban fridge, uh, in a very, uh, uh, how see that, um, without no regulation. Uh, for example, this, this is the urban center of Beijing. So according to the master plan, uh, in this area we have a central center and then we have, we call them a scattered cluster. Between them, there should be a green belt separating them from each other so that the green belt can be provided like a, a green space for urban residents. But we look at this reality. The green belt is actually filling with all kinds of constructions. Most of them, are, some of them are legal, but many of them are illegal. So uh, it's, it's already, uh, the, actually the green belt only exists in principle, in reality, it's, it's like that. Um, in the real rural area, still because because of the lack of the planning uh, administration, uh, rural constructions happen spontaneously. So uh, most of them um, are still in a bad situation. But this should, I should speak very carefully. You know, China is just too big country. So in certain area, the rural development is quite good. For example, in the Yangtze River Delta region, which is the most developed region of China, when you go to the countryside there, that's very nice. Uh, because it's already a developed region. But in many uh, developing regions, most of the rural areas are like this. They, they don't have a complete uh, uh, facilities. For example, they don't even have library. Uh, uh, they, they might have a clinic, but very simple one. So healthcare is also a problem. Uh, uh, they don't have good uh, primary schools. Uh, something like that. 
And the public services are in a low, uh, quite low standards and also buildings in a low uh, uh, quality. Uh, in some er rural areas, they have some kind of industries, but usually the industries is quite polluting. So pollution is another big problem for that. Uh, but on the other side, many of these rural areas, they have a long history. They even have some kind of uh, cultural heritage existing today, but the local people don't have any consciousness on that. So you see, you see the destroy or the disappearing of their local uh, heritage and also their local uh, culture. Uh, in terms of land use, um, also uh, it's, uh, the efficiency is quite low in the rural area. Um, so uh, I should explain in China, in order to guarantee a certain uh, uh, number of uh, farmland to guarantee the food uh, security. So we have a special land administration system. So every year they will have like a quota to uh, different locality, allow you to, be, to use them as construction land. So, and also we have a national standard uh, for cities, for towns, and also for villages. For example, for cities, for each urban residence, you can have a quota of one, uh, 100 square meter. And for towns, it's about 120 square meter for per person. And for village, it's 150 uh, square meters per person. Uh, in spite of that, uh, in towns or villages, normally their land use is over uh, any plan in terms of the total quota, in terms of the construction land per capita, and also in terms of the uh, rural homestead per family unit. Um, I just said that in, as a farmer, you have the right to have a piece of land for your homestead. Um, that uh, standard can be vary from region to region, but generally speaking, for each family, you could have 200 square meter for your uh, uh, house debt to build your, your housing. But in reality, in many places, the figure is over 400 square meters, and in some cases, it can be even more than 1,000 square meters. You know, for, for villagers, that's really a privilege. You know, they can have their land. But uh, when you look at, when you think about the land yield efficiency, it's a big waste. And also, when you look at the layout, I take a small town nearby Beijing, um, near the Sixth Ring Road of Beijing. So different colors means different function. Yellow for residents. Uh, the brown one refers to uh, uh, in industrial. And the red, red one, uh, yeah, the pink one refers to commercial. And then you can see actually they are, they are mixed with each other, quite dispersed and very low density. So that's in Beijing, you know, when land becomes more and more expensive. So this kind of uh, land use is really a kind of waste. We can have higher efficiency uh, to do something. So that's why we try to promote planning in rural areas to promote a high efficiency of land use. Uh, so as I just said that uh, uh, rural planning was only initiated in two, after 2008. Uh, they mainly targeting at small towns and also villages. But uh, they mostly concern the physical environment, um, how to build, how to regulate the, uh, the land use. Um, generally, we follow the principle of three concentrations. So we try to promote the industries to be uh, concentrated to the industrial park where we can offer also them with uh, uh, necessary uh, uh, services, for example, to treat uh, the pollution issues. And then we also try to encourage farmers to concentrate to uh, either urban or to rural communities. That means they don't live sparsely. Uh, we try to build up the either rural or urban communities with a little bit high density where they can live so that we can save uh, the lands. And also we try to promote the concentration of farmlands 
to cooperative farms. Uh, I mean, nowadays China, in, uh, in China, agriculture is still under the way of uh, modernization. So it's mostly they are still based on family rather than skilled production. So the key idea is by that way we can uh, improve the efficiency of land use. So just a small case here, so all the uh, green lands means industry, so, so originally they were quite dispersed and we try to plan two industrial park where they can be concentrated and all, even for the uh, villages which were originally quite dispersed, we keep some of the big ones and they encourage the others to uh, concentrate it to the, to the central area and then we can try to reclaim the original land into farmlands for uh, agriculture. So uh, by 2015, uh, not very bad, already more than 94% uh, of designated towns have their plans. Um, for townships, it's 28%, uh, but for villages, the percentage is still low. So it means we still have a lot of work to do uh, to promote planning. But in spite of that, there are still some problems with planning. Uh, firstly, uh, planning institution is better implemented in towns rather than the villages. You know, uh, for farmers, they, f they like freedom. They want to do things they, they can decide, right? And uh, also, until now, the rural planning uh, mostly restrained to physical planning. Uh, they are not uh, related to property issue. So sometimes it's hard to implement that because when we make the plan, uh, normally we have less consideration on the property issue. Uh, and also, uh, uh, we, we don't think a lot on the community construction because for rural China, it's, uh, the, the task is not only to improve their physical environment, actually to improve their social structure, how to build up again communities in, in the rural area. Um, and also mostly in a Chinese way, we always conduct planning in a top-down um, way uh, without any consultation with the local collective and even without any public participation of the villagers. So that's, I think, a big uh, problem nowadays. Um, and also, most of the rural plans are made by urban plants like me, who actually have quite few knowledge about the rural area and also about rural life. That's, I think, something we will try to do in our education uh, to let planners know more about rural life. And also, as I just mentioned, China is just a huge country. Actually, there are big regional differences from one region to another. But we usually, we have the, um, let's say we have the mentality to uniform. So we usually have the national standards, uh, but that national standard, when they go to the local, sometimes it's hard to implement them. So there is always the conflicts between the national uniformity and the local diversity. Uh, but still, there are some opportunities. Now, this, uh, since 2012, Chinese government issued the policy of new urbanization, which highlights the quality of urbanization rather than the speed or the quantity of urbanization. So uh, more uh, preferential policies and even direct investment nowadays go to the countryside. So we are also thinking about how to encourage young people go back to the countryside rather than to stay struggling in the big cities. Uh, uh, there are also uh, the reforms to reorient the urban-rural deal system. So this institution still exists, but we want to restructure, restructure it. For example, uh, the policy continuity encouraging household registrations in towns. So, you know, in, in Chinese, we, we, we call urbanization actually townization. We want to further develop in small towns to accommodate the immigrants from the rural areas, uh, rather to encourage them to go to the big cities, because when the city becomes too big, you know, it's, it's really hard 
uh, to provide them with, with uh, good uh, uh, living uh, environment. So uh, as I just said, household registration reform is going on in big cities based on credits and also land management reform on collective owned construction land. Uh, we try to put them also uh, on the land market so they can be transferred on the land market to attract uh, money from the market uh, to the countryside, so uh, to promote the development in the, in the countryside. So from the planning perspective, we are thinking uh, to, to do more work to regionalize the spatial layout through land adjustment at the town level. That means we will, um, for example, if you occupy too much land for your home, homestead, you probably need to give up certain area back to the collectivity, and we can use that uh, to, uh, to, uh, for the collective development. Um, uh, other things like we restructuring the land use uh, with respect to the uh, existing land use quota. That means whenever we plan a new town or new village, uh, try to think about to use the existing construction land rather than to think about incremental uh, construction land. Um, and also we are thinking about how we can uh, use the land as a kind of resources for the development of the village um, rather than to ask government to invest. You know, nowadays uh, it seems that uh, we have a lot of money, but to, when you really want to spend money, it seems that it's still quite limited. So try to think of how we can use land resources, a kind of resource, and use that, develop a part of that, and then use the benefit from this land in the redevelopment to improve uh, the situation of the original uh, village. And also during this process, how we can uh, um, introduce the uh, system of public uh, participation and also try to promote the cooperation of different uh, uh, stakeholders like government, villagers, local collectivity, and of course developers. So uh, it's going on, we are working on that, uh, but you know, uh, any reform takes time. So I think China is now at a very important transition period, even though the reform already uh, have already been for more than 30 years, but that will continue for many years in the future. I think that's all. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's the last one. The last one is actually uh, my reflection on the, our thinking on rural development. Uh, because uh, in China, there, there is always a big debate whether we should develop big cities, whether we should develop small towns, whether we still need to keep large area in as a rural area. So uh, for me, a, a rural area is really, a, a, a call it a reality. It's a kind of civilization. Uh, it's an it's a, a important part of our ecology. And also in rural area, it's an important part of our industry. It's a kind of human settlements, quite different from urban ones. So they are all important to keep them, and in some sense, even protect them, right? So uh, rural development will be a long-term historical mission for today's China, even though China is developed very quickly. Uh, I think the, the big task for the rural area in China is try to modernize them rather than to urbanize them. Yeah. And uh, so urban rural deal system as a specific institution uh, set up under the specific circumstance, I mean, in the planned economy period, uh, they still have far reaching influences. Uh, they will undergoing, they will undergo a very slow transformation. Even today, we cannot just, uh, I mean, uh, delete them because if we do that, probably we'll suffer from the, we call over-urbanization, which happened in the Latin American countries. Uh, you know, even though the urbanization level is already over uh, 
50% of China, we still have more than uh, seven, 700 million rural population. So it's still a huge, huge number. So rural planning as a policy tool, uh, the aim is to promote rural development and it actually functions as a platform to coordinate various objectives and also stakeholders of rural development. Um, in future, I think we should work more on to promote the bottom-up participation rather than directly top-down, I mean, uh, like enforcement. Um, and uh, also, I think for us nowadays, I think uh, uh, um, China, in some sense, is so different from the other part of, of the world. Uh, we even talk about the city, uh, talk about urbanity. We have different interpretation, like you in the United States. So I think it's important for us to rethink what kind of urbanity we work for, and also what kind of uh, 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 rurality that we should protect. Yes. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. So we will be happy to take questions. Is this still on? It is. We're going to ask you to have questions. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how or if there are wild areas still in China and how if they're classified under the rural system or if there's a different, how they're managed as well. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Are there rur uh, wild areas, like forested areas okay. still? And are they managed under the rural system or is there, are there challenges with those as well in terms of keeping those uh, areas intact? Uh, for the wild, it's more like uh, like uh, the protection natural pro natural protected natural area, right? So they are under the jurisdiction of the state. So we have like uh, some kind of we call the uh, uh, natural protection area. Yeah. So they are under the state jurisdiction. And so, is there a, a, a building in that area then is not allowed? Not allowed. Yeah, that's forbidden. Yeah, but still there there are small scale. Uh, I mean, construction there because you need people living in to take care of that area. So there are certain small villages inside, but it's forbidden for any large scale construction. Yeah. I had a question on the urban. Yeah. So I know, like in Beijing, they have the hutongs, which are the traditional houses. Yeah. Um, but you said that they didn't have any land ownership, but some families own some of those hutong traditional houses. How did that work? Was that because they were under a different thing? or? Well, I mentioned that this afternoon. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. OK, so let's see in that way. You know, um, we cannot just talk today. You know, for that, you need to think back at least the 60 years before. You know, when uh, China, uh, I mean, People's Republic of China was set up, we uh, had a kind of a socialization, right? So before 1949, yes, the land was private within the old city. So some people even had a certificate for their land, and also they have their certificate for their building, yes. But in the 1950s, you know, when China underwent this socialization, some of them were socialized. That means they became a property of the state. Some, some probably not. Uh, you know, at that time, as a new, which I'm, I just suppose, I'm not old enough to go through that period, but I just suppose, you know, that at that time, we didn't have very detailed regulations. So, but still, we have the process of socialization. Um, principally speaking, nowadays, because the old city is an urban area, the land belongs to the state. So people living in the old city, they only have their certificate. They have their right for the building. But some of the building were also socialized. They belong to the state. 
only small part probably belong to private. So when you talk about that, you cannot just speak generally. You really need to look at the case, what the situation is. I know it's, uh, it's very complicated. That's also why, you know, when we do urban renovation with the old city, it's very difficult. Thanks for being here. Yeah. I was curious, you, you made three points. One, um, that a lot of folks live in a rural environment by choice, that that is a living situation that they, they enjoy for the land. Um, another was that a lot of the planners that are coming into those rural environments are not from a rural and don't understand a rural living environment. And then towards the end, the third point was that these urban planners are sometimes taking land from folks who potentially want to be there on that land um, to design and bring the density into the villages. So I, I'm just curious, is there pushback from rural environments mm -hmm. to folks coming in and doing these sort of things um are they are they happy for the modernization or are there is there some sort of pushback for from that well uh let's see in that way uh, generally speaking i mean in the especially in the developing regions uh, most of the rural uh, areas are still in a not very good situation you can see from my slides so whenever government uh, initiated a planning project, they will also follow with investment. So they will help the villagers, for example, provide them with water supply. Uh, they can do uh, the rural road for them, but they will not touch their building. Uh, but we will plan for that. So generally speaking, it's welcome. And uh, at the same time, you know, uh, when, when you live too dispersed, it's not easy for government to provide you with services, even the public utilities. So that's why we try to concentrate them to a small area and so that the government can supply them with services. Generally speaking, it's welcome. But during this process, you know, whenever you touch their property, actually you touch their interest. Uh, in cities, you know, we don't have that property, so we are used to, okay, come, come they just do whatever, and, and then we accept. But in the rural area, they have their very special feeling of that. For urban planners like me, actually, we, if you don't live there, you don't understand. So that's why I, I, I speak that we should go there, stay long time enough to understand their understanding of their property and also try to understand what are their desire, what are their willingness, and then we help them to realize their willingness. Yeah. <laughs> sure, please. Um, I can't remember the name of the town uh, slash city, but I know that when I was in China working, I think it's Dongguan, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I went to visit the site and it was a very small place uh -huh. and lots of uh, tea fields, I think, tea plantations. Uh -huh. And since then, 25 years later, it's a gigantic, what I consider a gigantic city. Don't, so yeah, was, don't you mean the small town nearby Guangzhou? Yes, okay, which I is know. now a big town yeah. nearby Guangzhou. Yeah. So was that a was that because when I went, it was rural. Yeah. And it looked very rural. Yeah. Um, but obviously now it's very very dense. Yeah. So how was that? Was that a rural place that then got to jump on the hierarchy? That that. I think Dong, I think about? Dongguan nowadays is already a city. You when you were there, it might be a town. So nowadays it's already a city, 
But on the city, there might be towns and also townships. So there might be, again, a part of the area institutionally as rural area. So, but I, I think Dongguan is really, I think, I don't know, I don't have so to So it remember. graduated, yeah. I guess, yeah. is the thing. And then there are some cities that are called the ghost cities, right? The ghost city is another thing. The ghost city is actually the new urban area or new urban developed, mostly promoted by real estate development. Uh, so a lot of buildings built up, but there were quite few people moving in. Uh, for ghost city, I have my own understanding. Uh, we can view it uh, from uh, one point of optimistic. That means, you know, city development always takes time. Uh, look at Shanghai, when Sharon in Shanghai, uh, the Puxi area, the Lu Jiazui area was not developed. At that moment, in the 1990s, in Shanghai, there was a saying, they prefer one bed in the east part of the river rather than an apartment in the west part of the river. Because the eastern part is already a built up a city. And, and the, the western part is only, at that moment, is one, like a, a rural area. But only 10 years later, you know, the western part of that city is the most uh, expensive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it, it's, it's, it takes time. So for the ghost towns, in a certain period of time, they probably empty, but you never know how many years later they will be filled up. But there are, there are really some ghost towns, I think it's really uh, not reasonable. It's only a result of real estate development. They, yeah, they only want to money. Actually, they don't think about city development, I agree. Okay. So uh, I have a question. I have a question, comment. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, first of all, when I was viewing your presentation, and th thank you for this, um, it I, I couldn't help but look at the parallels between China and the United States, yeah. because there are so many, and they're so they're so like in really uh, vivid color in terms of uh, we have thriving cities, mm -hmm. we have dying towns. We have uh, rural areas that are either succeeding or failing, but because of different economic models. Mm -hmm. So for example, here, um, the, the, the rural areas that are, that are really uh, succeeding have done so because the individual, collect, the individual farmers have sold out to large corporations and, and the, the land is now either corporately run or it's run by one farmer mm -hmm. who has mechanized and owns a huge amount of property that they have to it's 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 because of the uh, because of the the market dictating exactly how things are going to run and yeah. and capital has determined the way that it's going to work yeah. whereas your country is approaching it from a completely different perspective and yet we face similar problems sure. Um, we have these small towns that are struggling. Uh, we have a um, uh, situation where the populations in these small towns are torn between, do I stay in this location or do I go to the city? Yeah. And we don't have yet exactly what you were describing in your solutions um, or next steps, which is we don't have a mechanism to identify how can we revitalize these mid-sized towns. Yeah. Um, and as a result, I don't know where China is going to end up, but if you look at recent American political uh, uh, experiences, those towns are the ones that have um, really contributed to a complete change in our government. Yeah. So, so, so this is not a problem that can just be sort of looked at and observed mm -hmm. with... Um, with a sort of a shrug of the shoulders. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually like it's, it's um, forced itself into where we live now. Yeah. Um, and I have no solutions to this. It's just an observation that despite the, the huge differences between the People's Republic of China's sort of founding in 1949 and the systems that were set up 
and all of the reforms that have been taking place and the American system that we have had in place now for uh, a couple of hundred years and it's sort of like slow evolutionary process yeah. that yet today we're still facing kind of parallel problems. Yeah, 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 I, I agree. I think um, even you look at the situation you, in Europe, the same, there's a, uh, we can, I don't know whether it's a conflict, but the big difference between the uh, urban, modern urban area and the, the rural area. Uh, even in terms of their political, uh, I mean, uh, opinions. So I think that's why in China, things 2012, we try to promote, we call it uh, balanced urban rural development. So we cannot only talk about city development, that, that doesn't work. With at the other side, you have to think about when city develops, how we can also develop the countryside. We need to keep a kind of balance between the two aspects so that we can keep like a healthy, society. Otherwise, the society couldn't work. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>
jobs and, and that, the, it's more of a social aspect to that? Again, that depends which region you are. Um, for example, in the Yangtze River Delta region nearby Shanghai, you know, that's the most developed region of China. They have a, a long tradition of good education and also transportation is very convenient. So there, really people prefer living in the countryside because at the same time you can benefit from the big cities and you can benefit from the countryside. And also because the education even in the countryside is of good quality. So um, there are some white colors from cities going back to the countryside because nowadays we can work on through net. So uh, really if it's in the developed region, they prefer stay in the countryside. It's, it's more like uh, in Europe, you know. Uh, but still in the developing regions, I think it's, it's almost impossible to do that in that way. But you know, internet really influenced the countryside. Nowadays, the farmers, they do trade through internet. And in, in recent years in China, there are several villages became quite well known because of their trading on the network. So that's also, uh, I mean, changing uh, the way of their life and also the way of their economy. And Alibaba, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Very far away. Yeah, and also nowadays, I think there is another one called uh, Ant. Um, they prefer small small number of funding for 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 farmers that will help them a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.